Hello and welcome back to the Math 200 lecture series for Kenyatta College. We are using PowerPoint presentations created from Mario Triola's textbook, Essentials of Statistics, 5th edition. My name is Ray Lapus. Chapter 2, Summarizing and Graphing Data. In taking a look at data, we might be interested in examining a handful of characteristics. The center finds the middle of the data set. Variation measures the spread of the data. Distribution describes the shape of your data set. Outliers are values that may lie far away from the majority of your data. And then time might be considered if your data seems to be changing over time. Section 2-2, Frequency Distributions. In this section, we will be looking at organizing a large data set so that we can construct a table and be able to transfer that table into a graph that might be able to give us a feel for the center, the spread, and the shape of the data set. A frequency distribution or a frequency table helps us distribute the data into categories or classes. This would then lead to a nice representation using a graph called the histogram. Some definitions, a lower class limit is the smallest number that can go to a particular class. An upper class limit would be the largest number that can go into a particular class. A class boundary separates the classes without using the upper or lower class limits. When we take a look at the class limits in the number line, we generally look at 50 and 70 and 80, or let's say 90, etc. But if we want to take a closer look at where the class splits between the first class and the second class, between 69 and 70, there is going to be a number in between there that would help us separate those two classes. And so 69.5 would be the number that would separate 69 and 70 and therefore be able to separate the two classes. Once we have that, we can figure out the distance between an upper class limit to the boundary or a lower class limit and the boundary and then extend that idea for the first boundary and the last boundary. So that's how you would find your class boundaries. The class midpoints are the numbers that are falling between an upper and a lower class limit. And we would find that by simply, simply finding the average. So for the first class, if we have 50 and 69, and then we find the average between those two, we would get 59.5, which is the class midpoint. The class midpoints are also sometimes called class representatives. The class width would be taking a look at the difference between any two consecutive upper or lower class limits. And if you did your frequency distribution correctly, all these class widths should be the same. So why would we want to construct a frequency distribution? 
It's a good way to summarize large data sets. We can begin to analyze the nature of the data and we also now have a basis for constructing our histogram. There are many ways to construct a frequency table. Here's one of the ways. First, we can determine the number of classes. As a general rule of thumb, we don't want anything less than five because if you have too few classes, it may not reveal anything for us. We also don't want to have too many classes, like more than 20, because again, it might not reveal anything for us. Once we figured out the number of classes we want, we can calculate the class width. We calculate the class width by finding the range and dividing by the number of classes that we decided on and the class width should be a whole number so we would round up. Now we select a starting point. We can select the minimum value of the data set or we can find another value that would be more convenient. Then we would find the first lower class limit and we use the class width to add the next lower class limit and continue on We find uh, upper class limits, and then we go through the data set and identify where each value of the data will go into what class. After we tally these up, we would write down our frequencies. A related topic to frequency tables would be a relative frequency distribution. A relative frequency simply puts our frequency table into a percent form. So the relative frequency would be calculated by finding a class frequency divided by all the sums of the frequencies and then you can change that into a percentage by just multiplying by 100 percent. In our example, our first class has a class frequency of 2. If we add up all these values, we get 78. So if we take 2 divided by 78, we will get our relative frequency. And then we continue on as another example, we would take 7 divided by 78 to get one of our other relative frequencies. A cul cumulative frequency distribution counts the current frequency along with the previous frequencies. For example, the cumulative frequency table for this would begin at 2 and then you add 2, you add 33 to 2 and you get 35. Now you add 35 to your current cumulative frequency and you get 70. And then 70 plus 7 is 77 and then finally you get 78 and whenever you deal with a cumulative frequency table this very last number is the same as the total. Later on we're going to be looking at normal distributions and a normal distribution is a distribution that has a shape of a bell when we see it in the graph. The frequency starts off low and then increases to a high part and then decreases back to a low frequency. Sometimes we call this symmetric. Now 
when we say symmetric, it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly mirror image, but as long as it's roughly mirror imaged, it would be fine. One thing we have to worry about is the presence of gaps. If we take a look at a frequency and we see a gap between two high points, then you might be looking at different populations. So for example, let's take a look at a frequency table of weights of pennies. It turns out that between um, 1983 or before 1983 the pennies were made mostly of copper between 83 and now most of the pennies have not been made mostly of copper but by zinc. If we look at the frequency dis distribution table here we see that there's a lot of pennies that were pretty light in this collection of pennies that we had and then there's a bunch of pennies that were pretty heavy and then not very many pennies fall in between here. So this tells us that the heavier pennies and the lighter pennies must have come from two different populations. That's the end of section 2-2.